A very warm welcome to all of you for the Spark tutorial from Adorica. Before I start, can I get a quick confirmation from all of you if I am loud and clear? On your right hand side, you will find a chat option or question bar. You can just type it, uh, type your options there. Very good, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Saurabh. Uh, so what you need to do is, as you can find out, uh, like I have asked you a question and you have just posted your response here. So feel free to interrupt me anytime in middle whenever you have any doubt and I will be answering you. Okay, so you can just interrupt me in middle from there and we can take up your questions. Let's start. What all things you can expect from this webinar? What is a Apache Spark? Why Apache Spark? Why we are learning this new technology? In today's what you must be hearing a lot about this Apache Spark, that Apache Spark is the next big thing in the world. Why? Why people are talking about that Apache Spark is the next big thing? What are the features in Apache Spark due to which we are talking like that, that Apache Spark is the next big thing again? What are the use cases related to Apache Spark? How Apache Spark ecosystem looks like? We will also do some hands-on example during the session. And in the end, I will walk you through a project which will be related to Apache Spark. So that is what you can expect from this session. Moving further. Now, first, we before we even talk about what is Apache Spark, it's very important to understand big data because that is uh, what we are going to use, right? Apache Spark will be used on big data. Now, what is this keyword big data? That is first thing which we are going to discuss. Now, if I ask you, what is big data? What do you understand by big data? What would be your response? Can I get some answers? On your right hand side, you will see a question panel. You can just answer it from there. Friends, please make this little interactive. It will really help you to understand this topic well. I will assure you by the end of this class, you will all go with a good knowledge about what is a Pakistan. But you need to help me to make it interactive. So you can tell me, what do you understand by big data keyword? Very good, Dhruv. Dhruv is saying that it refers a huge live data that is generated every minute on the internet from various resources. Very good answer. Saurav is saying that large amount of data generated on an open network, okay? They can be text, image, video, stream. Very good, Dhruv. Saurav, just see your statement. You are saying that large volume of data that you are calling it as a big data. But is it really the case? Can I call just large volume of data as a big data? No. That is just one of the property of big data. If I need to still define what is big data, I need to define in a broader term. I need to say not only the volume, but from various resources what the data is getting generated. For example, Facebook is generating a lot of data, audios, videos, medical domain, all these domains are generating big data. Now, if I talk about various kind of resources which is generating it, then we are also talking about different variety, right? And in the end, we will also be talking about with the speed with which this data is growing up. Because what about Facebook? Facebook is just 10 year old company. It is not very old company. It is just 10 year or 12 year old company. Now, in 10 to 12 years itself, Facebook have grown the data exponentially. They are dealing with very huge amount of data. Few months back, I heard a tweet from Mark, who is the CEO of Facebook. He mentioned that in his Facebook timeline, he mentioned it as a fun fact and mentioned that Facebook today has number of users equivalent to number of people living in this globe 100 years ago. That's a big statement. No, Sameer, we can also deal with unstructured data. I'm coming to that part. So they are talking a big thing, right? So now this is a challenge with Facebook. You can imagine how much big amount of data is talking about. Now, with respect to number of users itself, it is sounding such a huge data. Now, what are the activities what you do on Facebook? You tweet, right? Maybe you can type a message. You also upload your pictures. You upload your video. You upload your audio, right? You do all that stuff. Now, are they kind of uh, formatted data? How, what we used to use in our RDBMS system? 
answer is no, right? Definitely they are not kind of a very form, good formatted data. They are the different category of data and that category is called unstructured data. Now your RDBMS system, can they deal with that kind of data? Answer is no. RDBMS can deal with only structured kind of data which have some sort of pattern, right? Now when we talk about Hadoop, we also talk about audio video which we in other words we call it as unstructured data okay so that is also a format a variety of data what we deal with with data so we cannot just say that okay if the data is huge then we call it as a big data no that is just one property because what if if i have a unstructured data even if it is small in nature, but still it we have to use, still use this Hadoop tools, big data tools to solve them. So in those cases also, we use big data tools because RDBMS is not efficient to solve all those kind of problems. Okay, so that is one thing. Now, whatever data you get, they also can have some sort of problems. Like there can be a missing data, there can be a corrupt data. How to deal with that data? That is called veracity. That is also one property of big data. So you can see big data is not just about now volume part. It consists of multiple other factors like velocity, variety, veracity. All these are important component of big data. Like I just said, Facebook in 12 years is able to grow the data so much, right? When we, in terms of number of users itself, it is sounding like a big data. And after users are doing the activities on their platform, imagine how much data Facebook might be dealing with. Similarly, not only Facebook, even if we talk about Instagram, every minute so much of posts are getting liked like almost 17,36,111. I'm talking about every minute. I'm not even talking about like in a day basis. YouTube, every minute three hours of video are getting uploaded. But when you search anything in YouTube, does it make your query slow? No. How they are able to handle all that data so efficiently? We can talk about Facebook. Every minute so many users are posting the things or liking something, so much of event is occurring. We can talk about Twitter. Every minute, 3 lakh 47,222 tweets are happening. So, so much of activity is happening per minute. Just, we are talking about per minute, so you can imagine what must be happening now. So, there's a fun fact, which there's a statistics in fact, what tells that every two years data is getting doubled. You want to reach moon? Just burn all the data what you have right now with you and you will be able to reach the moon twice. That is the amount of data what we are dealing with at the current moment. Moving further. Now imagine what's going to happen in 2020. Whenever I take the batches, I always tell my students, you all are sitting on a data bomb and at a job bomb. This is going to happen very soon because what is currently happening is that only four to five percent companies who works with data have realized the potential of big data. Now the challenge with them is they are hesitant to move towards big data side right? to use the Hadoop tools and all. And the reason is they are afraid that what will happen in case if tomorrow they shift to big data domain and will they will be getting a good support? Will they get the number of users? who will be able to uh, solve the problem for them. All these problems they are still thinking. They are hesitant for the same reason to use the technologies like big data tools. Now, but they cannot stay for long like this because definitely there will be a stage where they will not be able to use RDBMS at all or any tra traditional system at all. In that situation, they need to make this transition. So it is expected by 2020, this 5% of the company will grow to 40%. And imagine right now itself, when you go to this indeed.com or knockery.com, you see so many jobs popping up for Apache Spark, Big Data and all. Imagine what is going to happen in 2020. There will be a huge demand and less supply of people. I, I generally say this, so uh, in your company, if you are working, let's say in a database company, you must be seeing your managers 
they are maybe senior directors, maybe VPs, and you must be thinking sometimes or the other, other that uh, these people were really lucky. They started their careers 20 years back when uh, Oracle DB or RDBMS were just coming up, and today they became VP. And I am still sitting at the software developer position. That's a very general thought which comes at some of your mind. I'm pretty sure about it. Now you are exactly sitting at the same position. Tomorrow generation, your future generation is going to exactly think in a similar manner. They will also be thinking in a same way that these guys were lucky when this big data domain was just coming up, they actually shooted with a purchase path. And they became today VP and I'm still sitting at this position. So you will be occupying that place sooner because this is the domain which is going to blast. That is for sure. And this is not me, my, I'm not telling it. This is all the predictions from the statisticians and the analysts. And I'm talking not about the small analysts. You can just read the blocks. You can easily get all those things. In fact, a lot of people have also come to this level and said that people in next five years, the companies who will not be transforming towards big data or Apache Spa, they will not even be able to survive in the market. This is also being said by the analyst. Now, imagine by 2020, how much of data we will be dealing with. You talk from animals, shopping cart, vehicles, any sort of event which is generating data. Imagine the amount of data we are going to deal with. In fact, this you might have heard about this term IoT, Internet of Devices. That is itself requiring big data, right? Because that is generating so much of data. So, so many things will be happening around you. Talking about big data analyst and what exactly this big data analytics is, what exactly we do there. Now, this is a process where, so first of all, let's understand what is analytics. Analytics is a process where you have, you are given the data and you generate some insight from it, some meaningful insight from it. You want to get something, some information from that data because currently when the data is sitting with you, you don't have any idea about the data. What is there in this data and all, you don't have any idea about it. But when you are working with respect to that data with uh, as an analyst, then you want to generate some meaningful information out of the data. That is called analytics. But now the major challenge is with big data, because the data has grown up in volume in such a great extent, how we can analyze their data. Can we use that data to gain some business insight? All those points we want to understand. Then this domain is called big data analytics. Now there are two sort of analytics which are generally done. The first sort of analytics is called batch analytics. Second sort of analytics is called real time analytics. What is all that? Let's understand it one by one. What is exactly this batch analytics and real time analytics? Now. Everybody must be using washing machine at your home, right? Or at least I've heard about washing machine. Now, what you generally do when uh, you collect your clothes and then wash it someday, or you just generally, as soon as you take out the clothes, you first wash it and then go for a bath and then use it, right? So you generally do this part, right? You collect usually the clothes and maybe someday you just put it in the washing machine and just process all your clothes. When I say process all your clothes, means washing of all your clothes. This kind of processing is called batch processing, where you collect some data and then process it later. So this kind of processing we will be calling it batch processing. So you can say on historical data when you do some sort of processing, that is called as batch processing, real time processing. Let's see one example. Let's say you are doing uh, your credit card transactions. I'm uh, pretty sure that most of you must be using credit card or debit card online, right? Now, even if you do a payment to Edureka, you might be doing it online. So definitely everybody must be using their cards. Now, let's say if you are sitting right now in India, sitting in Bangalore city and doing a credit card transaction. Now, immediately after 10 minutes, your card is also swiped in US. Is it possible? Definitely no. But do you think it makes sense for banks to kind of let the transaction still happen? And later they can just see that whether it's a genuine transaction or not, right? Definitely they don't want to wait. Otherwise, if the fraud happens, it will be their loss, right? So they what they do as soon as any real time event when they receive that a person is trying to swipe the card at some location, which do not looks like a genuine transaction. 
they will either start sending you an OTP or they will block that transaction. They will immediately give you a call. They'll ask you whether you have done this transaction because this looks unusual to us. All those questions they will start asking and once you approve, then only they will let that transaction happen. Processing is happening on the historical data or the current data? Current data, right? So which means what? We are doing this processing in the real time. As and when the data is coming, I am doing the processing. Means immediately as soon as I swipe the card, at the real time my system should get activated and start running the algorithms and checking whether I should allow this transaction or not. Now this second type of processing is called real time processing. Okay, so just to explain you the difference between batch processing and real time processing. So batch processing works on the historical data by at the same time the second kind of processing works on the immediate data. That, that's the difference between them. Why we are talking about all that, right? If we talk about real time analysis, I just talked about few use cases just right now, like credit card in banking, it's very important. For government agencies, you are applying for Aadhaar cards and all. So if you are in India, you might be doing it. Can you give one more instance for real time processing? This is in front of you, Samir, now. Now if we talk about uh, any stock market analysis, right? Stock market analysis. If we talk about that, right? Now immediately what happens? Lot of companies are there. I am not sure whether you have heard about Tower Research, Goldman Sachs. Have you heard about these company names? Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, even Tower Research. If you have heard about these names, what they do? They have developed a smart algorithm. What that algorithm do? That you apply your money, you give them your money of your stocks to them. What they will do? That algorithm will kind of do a prediction and tell that, okay, this stock price is going to be high this stock price is going to be low. They are not making their algorithm public because that they are bread and butter. So definitely if they do that, it will be their loss. But what they do is they have a smart algorithm and that algorithm is happening at the real time. Means at any event, if they see any uh, unusual event because of which uh, the market can go down or the stock price uh, uh, like say stock is can, can come down, what will happen is they will immediately sell that stock so that the customer do not go in loss. If they find some event at the real time, when any stock can make profit, they will by default buy that stock. So these set of algorithms are running at the real time scale. Got it now, Samir? Okay. So these all companies are using this real time processing part. Similarly, there can be multiple examples, telecom companies, healthcare. Now for healthcare, it's very important. A patient is coming. Now as and when the patient came, we immediately want to get some insight from whatever uh, information is given and based on that, do some processing means start treating the patient, right? So all those things are also happening at the real time. Now, when to use, why a purchase part? when Hadoop is already there. Why we were talking about this batch processing and real time processing? Let us understand that part. Point number one, which is very important. In Hadoop, you can only work on batch time processing. Means your Hadoop is not meant for real time processing. So now what happens? Let's say you have collected a data on day one. On day two only you will be able to process it. Something of that sort. I'm not just saying that that you have to do it in a day itself. Even the data is, let's say, one hour old. That's a historical data only, right? But you will not be immediately able to assess that data. That is what being done in Hadoop systems. But when we talk about Apache Spark, there is no time lag. What you can do here is, as and when the data is coming, you can immediately process it immediate processing can happen in case of Spark. Now you can ask me another question. So Spark is only for real time data? No. Spark can deal with historical data means batch kind of processing as well as it can do real time of processing. So it can do both kind of processing. That's an advantage with Apache Spark. Is it the only advantage? No. Let's understand few more things with respect to Apache Spark. Now, when we talk about Hadoop, right? So as I just gave you this part, like it happens with batch processing. Now, when we comes to Spark, it happens with respect to your real-time processing. Now, so the same thing which I just explained you. 
So with Hadoop, you can have handle the data from multiple sources. You can process the data in real time. It's very easy to use. Now, anybody who have already written MapReduce programming? No. <laughs> if you have done that, you might be knowing that MapReduce programming is a little tricky. Okay? It's not that easy. Like Samir have done that. Samir, you can easily convey that, right? So it's not very easy. Like for a beginner's PhD to learn MapReduce is not an easy task. It takes time. It's complicated in terms of writing the program. With Spark, things are very easy. Even Spark have one best advantage, faster processing. Spark can be processed very fast in comparison to your MapReduce program. That is one of the major advantage with Apache Spark. Let us go and understand now in detail. Once I explain you that part, you will be all clear why MapReduce was slower why Apache Spark is faster? Why we are making all this statement? What is Apache Spark? How it works? So let's understand this part. So I'm going to my whiteboard now. Just give me a moment now. I let me share my screen. Okay. So let's go step by step. Let's understand what uh, MapReduce was. What was the problem with MapReduce? When we, I just said that MapReduce is slower, what is the reason? So I'm just going to uh, take you through a little detail now. So let's understand this part. Now let me take some example and let's say that example is having a file. That file let's say is going to have some data. Let's say apple, banana. So I'm assuming that all of you already have knowledge about what is Hadoop systems. You know about how data is getting processed in Hadoop system. If you do not, you need to let me know. Okay? Like we split the data into 128 MB and all. So I'm assuming that you all already are aware of this topic. Okay? Now orange, let me copy paste. So let's say my data is of this sort. Okay, let's say this is my file. Now I'm telling you already, let's say this file, what is there, is let's say of uh, 256 MB. Now if I'm dividing this data into my default size, how many blocks it will create? Two blocks. So it is going to be 128 MB, 128 MB. Now this is going to create two blocks, 128 MB and 128 MB. Now what uh, let's say your boss came to you and said to you, you need to, uh, I have a problem like this and you need to give me a word count of this problem. When I say word count of the problem, now in this file I have only three keywords, apple, banana, orange. How many times apple is occurring in this file? How many times banana is occurring in this file? How many times orange is occurring in this file? You came out and started working on this way. You thought it's an easy problem because I can divide my file into two parts, 128 MB, 128 MB each. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, uh, distributed fashion, I'm going to work on it. In order to work on distributed fashion, what I'm going to do is, I am going to, let's say, start solving this problem in this way. I will say, okay, I'm going to denote now apple by A, orange by O, banana by B. Just to make it little simple. Now, what you are going to do, let's say you said apple came, I want to append one in front of this. Second time banana came, now you gonna append one in front of this because this is occurring first time. Orange came, you started appending one in front of this. Now apple came again. You saw that apple have already occurred before and the count was one. So this time you will be increasing the count by one and you made it two this time. Now again you did this algorithm in the similar manner for banana. You kept on doing this for your first block of code. For the second block of code which may be working on some other machine, you did exactly the similar step. Okay, You did the exactly the similar step. Now what is the next step what you will be doing in this case? Now in this case the next step will be that you will be combining both the outputs whatever came out. So let's say first of all you want to combine apple how many time it offered right? So let's say from here you got the output of let's say apple comma 20 in the last. From this block to let's say you got the output of a comma 34 in the last, right? 
Similarly, for banana also you did that, okay? So for banana, let's say you got 56, right? Similarly, you did for second banana, this orange and this orange. Then in the end, you will combine this and give the output, right? So you will be doing something of this sort next, A comma 20 comma 34. And then here also you will do for banana and then you will do for orange. And then in the end, you were telling that, okay, A comma 54. You bring this solution to your boss and tell him, I solve this problem. Your boss is going to be not happy with you. Why? There is a bottleneck here. There is a problem with this approach. This is not the right approach. Can anybody tell me where is the performance bottleneck here? Where is the performance bottleneck? Why I am telling you that this is not the right approach? Can anybody see this problem statement and tell me where is the problem? Samir is saying aggregation part. Uh, why Samir is aggregation part is the problem? Okay, what about others as well? One has to wait for other. No, let's say that problem is not there. Let's say it is very quick. One has to wait for other. No, no, that's not the uh, right solution. That actually is not a problem. So if this is uh, kind of connected in a way that it will not be, uh, they may not wait for other enough. What is the other solution? What is the problem here? And then what will be the solution? Can you see the problem here? This 128 MB file, do you think it is small when I only have text data? Do you think it is going to be small? No. Now, when you are doing this step, don't you think you are decreasing your performance? Why? Because every time an element is coming, you are going and checking back whether that element have occurred before or not and secondly then you are adding up this number right so don't you think this is a bottleneck for us right i don't want to do this because every time a new entry is coming every time it need to go back and check whether that element have occurred before or not this is the major bottleneck for your algorithm now how map reduce have solved this how map reduce have solving this what is the correct solution for this? So let us see how we can solve this. So from where this bottleneck starts? Bottleneck started because we were looking back. How about if we remove that bottleneck? So let's see. So let me remove this solution from here. And now what we are going to do is, let us give a better solution. So what we are going to do? So let's say I am going to make apple comma one this time. I am going to make banana comma one. I am going to make orange from a one. Now when the apple came again uh, this time, I am not going to go and look back. Now again even here, I am going to only put comma one in front of this. So whatever keyword is coming, I am just appending one in front of this. Similarly, I did for my second block also. For my second block also, I did the exactly the same stuff. I am not waiting for my, I am not going and checking for my previous entries. Now, in the next step, what I am going to do, wherever Apple came, I want to bring them together. So what would be the step here? I am going to combine these entries. Okay, from both this machine, I am going to combine these entries. And what I am going to do, wherever Apple uh, is occurring, let's bring them together. Apple comma one, Apple comma one, Apple comma one, from both the machines, for wherever Apple was there, just bring them together. How we can do it? By doing a sorting. Okay, bringing everything together in one machine and then by doing a sorting step. Similar thing, I am going to do for banana. So let's say I say banana comma one, banana comma one. Let's keep on doing this. Now similar thing, I can do for orange as well. Okay, so I can keep on doing that. Now, what is the next step? In the next step, it is going to just combine up all the one like this. So wherever A was, one was coming, I'm just bringing up together. Similarly for banana, I'm going to do that, right? Can everybody smell the solution now, right? We can smell the solution. What is the next thing I need to do? I need to just combine everything, aggregate everything. So let's say this uh, one is offering three times. 
that will give an output a comma 3 b comma 3 whatever the number of one would be there i will be combining that output so let's say a comma 3 b comma 3 whatever be the output okay i'm just giving an example here now this is how map reduce solves our problem so if you see what are the steps we did the first step what we did is called as mapper phase second step what we did these two steps is called as sort and shuffle phase and the third step what we are doing here is called as reducer phase so these are the three steps involved in map reduce programming now this is how you will be solving your problem now okay we understood this part but why map reduce was slower this is still a mystery to us right because we want to definitely understand that why we were talking about that map reduce is slower in order to solve this what we are doing is so i am right now assuming that my replication factor is one again i am assuming that you know all this part from hadoop systems if you do not know you need to ask me okay so that i can give you an appropriate example for that so i am right now assuming that you know the replication so i am assuming my replication factor is one in this case now what is going to happen now if i see this actually i am doing this so I have these two machines, I have these two machines and then these two machines, so right now my uh, all the operations are happening. So this is let's say your name node, again I am assuming you know this, if you do not you have to stop me. This is, these two are your data nodes, okay, these two are your data nodes. So where the data resides? At the data node. So what is going to happen? Let's say this is your block B1. And let's say this is your block B2. So what happens? This B1 block, if I'm considering that my replication factor is 1, this B1 block is let's say residing in the hard disk of data node 1. And this B2 block is residing in the hard disk of data node 2. Okay, This is let's say data node 2. This is let's say data node 1. Now if you notice what's going to happen. Where you perform your processing? Do you perform your processing in your disk level or you perform your processing in the memory level? Can I get an answer? Where your processing happens? Memory, right? It's always the memory where the processing happens. So now what we have to do is, now let's say the mapper code came because the first code which is going to run will be mapper code. When the mapper code will come to this machine, this block B1 will be moved out from the disk, means copied from the disk to the memory of this machine. So B1 block will come to the memory of this machine and the mapper code will be executed. Similarly, B2 block of this machine will also come towards the memory of this machine and it will be getting executed. Now, if you are already from computer science background or even if you are not, you might have heard that whenever there is a input output operation happen. When I say input output operation, I mean when you read any of the data from your disk or you write the data to your disk. So that is called your input output operation. So what I am saying is, so you might have uh, heard this, that whenever there is an input output operation happen, it degrades your performance. Because you have to do a disk seek and all those stuff. So that's the reason it makes your performance slow. Now in this example, can you notice I am doing an input output operation? Right now this is my input. I have to copy the data to my memory. Now the mapper output is what? Mapper output is this, right? This is a mapper output. Now mapper output, let me call this as let's say O1. Let me call this output as O2. Now what is going to happen? All this output will be given back to the disk. Now this O1 will be stored back here, O2 will be stored back here. What happened? I have stored back my O2 mapper output here. Now if you notice, this is again an input output operation, right? I am doing an output operation to my disk. Question comes sort of, what would happen if the block size is large? Will it efficient to use up the memory? Right now, we have to assume that this memory is good enough to at least hold up 128 MB of data. 
otherwise you will get an error. In Mac Reduce programming, you will simply get an error if you have let's say 128 MB of the data, but if you have less than 128 MB of memory, you will get an error. But Spark has a very smart way to solve this problem. Spark do not have any problem even if you have less memory. It still takes care of it. That is a very interesting story about Spark, but when it comes to MapReduce, it will throw an error. Clear, Saurabh? That is the reason we actually divide our data to 128 MB, so that at least our memory should be enough to handle it. Now, what will happen? So, um, I got my first oven and I have already observed my input-output operation. Now, sort and shuffle will happen. Sort and shuffle will happen on one machine, let's say, right? So, let's say this step is happening in one machine. So, if you notice, the data is coming from uh, all this machine to one machine. So, let's say this they decide to do sort and shuffle on, let's say, data node 1. So, this O2 machine will be having a network transfer of data, right? This O2 will come here. Now, after that, this sort and shuffle step will happen. Let's say the output which is coming out from this is O3. This is O3. Okay. Now again this O2 will be sent to the memory, O2 will be sent to memory and O3 will be again saved in the disk. After that again you will be sending the reducer port, reducer port will bring O3 into the memory and again pushing the final output to the disk. Can you see so many input output operation happening in just one program, right? Mapper did input output, sort and chapel have done network transfer as well as input output. Third step, producer have done the input-output operation again. Can you see so much of input-output operation in one program? That is the reason your map reduce programs are slower in nature. Everyone clear? Why map reduce programs are slower in nature? What, if you have already executed the word count example and on in map reduce, you might have noticed that when you execute, it do not give an immediate output. It takes a good time to execute the output. And why that happened is because there are so much of input output operation. Thanks, Ali. Let's move further. So this is the problem with MapReduce. Now let's see that how Apache Spark is solving this problem. How Apache Spark solved the problems and why it is faster. Why we are saying that my that I, I will be able to give the output in faster time. So let's understand that. Now, uh, in order to explain you this, let me first of all okay. So let's say I have a file again here and let's say my data is like this 1, 3, 56, 78 some more data, some more data. So let's say this data is there. Similarly, there is more data, 34, 78, 3, 6. Okay. Now let's say this is one more data which we have. Similarly, let's say we have more data here. Let's say 23, 67, 1, 9. Okay. Some more data. Now I'm telling you this the file is of 384 MB. 384 MB. This file is of 384 MB. And second thing is, let's say the name of the file is f.txt. Okay. Let's say this is the name of the file. Now, I am writing some alien words for you. Please do not worry about that because I will be explaining you this portion. Now, let's say if I have... Um, do not worry about what is this. I am going to explain it. Let's understand what exactly we are doing here. Now, in this example also, let's say I have created a cluster. This is my name node. These are your data nodes. Now, what is happening here? 
am telling you that this file f.txt is of 384 MB. So it's very obvious that my file will be divided into three parts b1, b2, b3 block. Now again I'm assuming here that my replication factor is 1. So I'm calling this as b1 block, calling this as let's say b2 block, calling this as let's say b3 block. Each of 128 MB. Now what would be my next step? So I have just understood that we have uh, these blocks. Now let's say these, this file is residing in my HDFS. So where it resides? In the disk. So let's keep it in the disk. B1 block here, B2 block here, B3 block here. Now where it will be residing? In the data nodes at the disk, right? Usually this is where our SDFS, uh, my data sets. Now, when as soon as I hit this first statement, first of all, before even understanding this part, let me explain you one more thing. What is the main entry point in Java? Without which you cannot write any program. Anybody know? Main function, right? Without main function, you cannot do anything. Now, in Apache Spark also, there is one main entry point without which none of your application will work. And that entry point is called Spark Context. We also denote Spark Context as SC. Now, this is the main entry point and this resides at the master machine. So we will be keeping this SC here. Okay? For when you write your Java programs, let's say you have written one project. For one project, there will be a separate main function. For another project, there will be a separate main function. Similarly, this SC will be separated for each individual application. Now let's understand this first line of code. What this do? So ignore this RDD for some time. What is this RDD doing? Just ignore that part. You can right now relate this RDD as some data type. Like for example, in Java we have string data type. So you can just replace this RDD as string for some time. Now definitely if I'm replacing this RDD with a string, that means number is a variable. So let's assume that number is a variable for some time. SC we have just seen that SC means Spark context without which your Spark application will not even execute. Now this text file, this is an API of Apache Spark. We use, uh, we understand this in more details usually in our Spark sessions, but I will just give you an idea about what is this text file do. What this text file API will do in Apache Spark would be whatever file you have written inside it, f.txt, it will go and search that file and will load it in the memory of your machine. What does I mean by that? Now in this case f.txt is where? In three machines. f.txt is b1 block, b2 block, b3 block. So what is going to happen would be your b1 block let me create this. Let's say this is my RAM. Okay. Let's say this is my RAM. Now, what is going to happen in this case would be this B1 block will be copied. I'm not saying move. Will be copied to the memory of this machine. B2 block will be copied to the memory of this machine. B3 block will be copied to the memory of this machine. So this is how your blocks will be sent to this machine memory. Now what is going to happen? So we have just understood that B1, B2, B3 will be there. Here I am assuming that my memory is big enough to hold all this data. Now what happens in case will all the blocks say it's not mandatory sort of? It is not mandatory that all your block size should be same. It can be different as well. Okay, it doesn't matter. Whatever would be the block size, irrespective of that, it is going to copy the block towards the memory. That is what happened with my first line of code. Now, these three files which are combinedly sitting in memory, 
is called as RDB. So these three files which is sitting combinedly in memory is called as RDB. What is the name of RDB we have given? Number RDB. So we have given the name to this RDB as number RDB. What is RDB? RDB is a distributed data sitting in memory. What is the full form of RDD? Full form of RDD is resilient distributed data. Now let me ask you one question. Is this a distributed data or not? Is it a distributed data or not? Yes, it is, right? It is a distributed data. What do you understand by resilient? Can I get an answer? What do you understand by this keyword resilient? Though it's not an English class, but still I just want to understand what do you understand by this keyword resilient? Resilient means reliable. Okay, that's an English meaning for it. Reliable. Now, yeah, you can call that sort of. Now, when I say something is reliable, now, which brings me to a question, right? Now, whenever I'm talking about RAM, first of all, in RAM, if I'm keeping the data, and this is the most volatile thing in my whole system, right? Because whenever you have something in RAM, if you restart your laptop, everything will get erased from your RAM, right? It's the most volatile thing. Now, I'm still saying RDB is resilient. How? Because I am going to lose the data as and when immediately I just uh, restart my laptop or something, I am going to lose my data. Now, how this is reliable? Remember the replication factor? Replication factor? So let's say the replication factor is 2. Okay? Let's say replication factor is 2. Now, in this case, let's say if I have few more machines. So let's say B1 block is sitting here. Okay? Let's say B2 block is copied here. Let's say B3 block is copied here. Okay? Any of the machine, let's say they are residing like that. Now what is going to happen? Let's say in this condition, my, uh, let's say this block fit. This block fit. So what we lost? What we lost? Yes, Dhruv, I have not yet reached to that stage, but I will be speaking about that. We lost this. We, we lost B3 block. Now, is B3 anywhere else? Yes, B3 is here also. What is going to happen? It will immediately load B3 also in this machine. It will immediately load B3 in this machine. Now, B1 and B3, both will start residing together in this machine. And then what's going to happen? These three will consist of an RDD. So again, B3 will be moved to the memory and immediately that RDD will be created. So that is the way I may in the RDD ensures that it is resilient. Even if you lose the data or if you lose any of the machine, it does not matter. It takes care of it. So this is called your resilient portion. Now, let's move further. So we just understood what is RDD and secondly, how it is resilient. Let's take one more step. So we have created our number RDD. Now I'm also creating a filter one RDD. But now what I am going to do is, I am going to create it on my number RDD. See this number RDD? Dot map. Again, this map is an API. What this API do is, uh, you, usually we understand this part in our sessions in detail. But let, just let me give you this part, uh, a brief about it for your introduction. Whatever code you will be writing inside this map API will be executed. So whatever code you will be writing inside this line will be executed. So right now I've just written some English keywords. In this place, you have to replace this English keyword logic to find values less than 10 with some programming logic. Maybe it can be a Python program, it can be a scalar program, it can be anything. Whatever program you want to write, you can mention it here. So whatever code you will be writing, your map function will be responsible or your map API will be responsible to execute it. Now, what we are doing here, 
One more point. RDDs are always immutable. Whenever say I say that RDDs are immutable, that means if you have already put the block V1 into the memory, you will not be able to make any change in your block V1. You will not be able to make any change in your block V1 now. Now what is going to happen? So let us come here first. Before I start working on this part, let us see this part. So let's say you have written some scalar function or a Python function, which is uh, some function which is just finding out all the values which are less than 10. So let's assume in this B1 block, in this B1 block, you have, let's say, these all values, all these values. So in that case, what would be the output here? What would be the output here from this block? 1 comma 3, right? Because these two values are less than 10. 1 comma 3. So can I call this block as B4 block? Let's call it as B4 block. What would be the output from here? It will be 3 comma 6. So let's call this also as B5 block. Similarly, if you notice this, I have let's say 1 comma 9 and let's call this as my B6 block. Okay. So let's say this is B4 block. This is B5 block and this is B6 block. Now what is happening here that this B1 block which is sitting in memory I will be doing this when this code will be executed the execution will happen on this B1 block and a new block B4 will be created. I am not going to do any change in B1 block. I am just doing the processing on this B1 block and creating a new block which I am calling it as B4 block. Similarly, from this B2 block, you will be generating this B5 block which will be again sitting in memory. Similarly here, B6 block will be generated. Now in this case, your B1 block and B4 block both will start residing in memory together. Similarly, B2 and B5 will be residing together and B3 and B6 will be residing together. Collectively, all these three, B4, B5, B6, will be again called as an RDD. The name of that RDD would be filter1 RDD. Clear everyone? What is RDD? How RDD works? This concept is clear to everyone? Okay. So this is how Spark works. Now let me ask you a question. Don't you think this will be faster? Are we doing many input output operation just like I was doing in MapReduce? No. Only the input output operation happens at the first stage. When I was using sc.txt file. After that, my data was always sitting in memory and that's the reason I am not doing any sort of input output after that and that is the reason it is going to be giving you faster output. So that is the reason Spark is faster in comparison to MapReduce. But I think the RAM, yeah, definitely that is there. But still Spark have a way if your RAM is low also it can handle it and that concept is called pipelining concept. I am not going to cover it in this session but yes there is a way even if your memory is less, Spark takes care of it. Very interesting concept in Spark. Okay? Yes, again. That's a very interesting concept that Spark can still handle if you have a little less memory. So that makes Spark very smart framework. That is the reason people are going for this framework. Now, so you, uh, usually in our uh, Eduraker sessions, we go over all these topics in detail that how Spark handles it, what if what if this situation happened, then what will happen? All those things will go over. It will spit the extra data to the disk? No. It will not load any data to the disk, but still will be able to handle it. Okay? That's a smart thing, right? You must be wondering, curious about how, but that's a smart part about pipelining. Is there any limitation on number of concurrent client requests? No. You can read as many number of times as you want. If the writing you want to do, then only it's a problem. Okay, there is no limitations on that. Now, let's take one more step. Okay, so we have just seen this part. Now, if you notice what is happening here, so initially what I was having, 
So right now I have a filter one RDD. So let me co denote it by S1. Okay. This is my filter one RDD. This filter one RDD is dependent on something. Yes. It is dependent on my number RDD. Right. On my number RDD. My number RDD is dependent on something. Yes. F dot txt. So this file it is eping. Now can you see this is a graph which I just generated here. This graph is maintained by Spark context as soon as you execute all this statement and this DAG, this is called DAG, directed acyclic graph is also called as lineage. Okay, so in lineage what happens? It maintains a DAG which maintains all the information about the dependencies. Like F1 is having a dependency on number. Number is having a dependency on F dot TXT. So this dependency graph, what it is maintaining is called as lineage. So this is very important factor about this. Now, if you notice what is happening, this B4 block got generated due to B1 block. This B5 block got generated due to B2 block. And this B6 block will be generated due to B3 block, right? In other terms, I can say this F filter one RDD got generated with the help of number RDD. So number was also an RDD, but from that number RDD, I created a new RDD that is called as filter one RDD. This step is called as transformation step. Okay. So this step we called it as transformation step. Now, are we printing any output here? No, we are keeping only the data in memory. In Java, we used to use this uh, print statement and all, right? In Spark, we don't have print statement, but instead of that, we have a collect statement. So let's say if I want to print B4, B5, B6, that means I want to print filter1 RDD. I can write filter1 dot collect. This will print B4, B5, B6 to your console. Now this thing what you are doing here, this collect RDD what you are doing means whenever you are printing any output, we call this as our action. Okay. So this step in a spark context is called as action. So this is how you work on spark. So there are two major steps. One is transformation where you can convert one form of RDD to another form of RDD. And second thing is called action where you can print your output. Okay. So these are very important points to keep in mind while working on Apache star. Let's go back uh, to our slides. Any question on this before I move back? I can again come back to it. Everyone clear about these step by? Good. Great. Let's move back. Now, if you notice here, the same thing we just discussed, batch processing, real-time processing. Moving further, this is how it is done. So this, I just discussed about this part that Spark provides you faster processing. So basically, RDD creation start with the transformation. Yes. Yes, sir. Now, this faster processing is the part which we have just discussed. And can you also see it is very easy to use? Right? It is very easy to use in comparison to my MapReduce. If you have already done MapReduce programming, or if you remember that apple orange banana example, right? Definitely my RDD way is much simpler in comparison to your MapReduce program. If you see the MapReduce code, it is complicated in nature. But Spark program is very simple to look at. So that's the reason your Spark program carries a very uh, simple nature to work on. Now moving further, let's understand our Spark success story. What are the things we have now? Spark success stories, there are a lot of people who are using it these days. Like if we talk about stock market, stock market is using Apache Spark a lot because of faster processing capability, easier in nature, plus a lot of things which are available with Spark easily. Twitter sentiment analysis, maybe a trending tweet is happening. Based on that, some company want to uh, make some profit out of it. Maybe they start doing some campaign based on that. Banking credit card fraud detection. I gave already an example of credit card where let's say some fraud is being detected. Maybe they're expecting that this do not sounds like a genuine transaction. 
can be done with the package path. Map reduce, it is impossible to do because it cannot even perform on real time processing. Secondly, even if we try to apply on historical data, it will be slower. That's a challenge there. In medical domain also we apply Apache's Spark a lot. So these are the areas where Apache's Spark is getting used. Talking about Spark now, right? We have already discussed what is Spark. So now in Spark we have already seen real time processing and everything. Now Apache Spark is an open source cluster. It is available to you. It's free of course. You may not pay to work on that. That is also one of the very important part why Spark is famous. It can you can perform real time processing, batch kind of processing, every kind of processing you can perform on it. You can perform your programming part. Okay. You can do a uh, data parallelism. It can also take care of fault tolerance. We have already seen the resi uh, resilient part, right? It is reliable. That portion is called fault tolerance here as well here. Now multiple, it is built on top of MapReduce. What it will I get as an output if I use connect function just after creating the path already? It will just print out the original Python. Sorry. Okay. In fact, I will do an execution practically and show you one example there as well. So that you can remain clear that what exactly how it, it is being done. How you can load the data and how you can see the data as well. Okay. I will show you a practical also just within few minutes. Great. Now let's move further. So this is about the Apache's path. Now, now it's very easy for me to explain you all these things because we have already seen it. Is path always used with Hadoop? Can we use it standalone? Yes, that's a fun fact. You can use it standalone as well. No need for Hadoop cluster. You can simply even create a Spark thing on your own simple Windows machine and can start working on it without requiring any SDN. You can keep the file locally and work on it. That's the fun part about it, right? You need not require HDFS at all. I will show you one example of that also, okay? So that you remain clear that how in standalone itself I can use Apache Spark. I do not even require my SDFS to work on it. That's the fun part, right? So many advantages you can make out on your own now. Spark is giving almost 100x time faster speed. Don't you think it's an awesome speed? 100x. I'm not talking about double the speed or triple the speed. I'm talking about 100x time faster, which makes now Spark very powerful. You might be hearing a lot that a lot of companies are migrating from MapReduce to Apache Spark. Why? I hope you got your answer. It's simple as well as it is making your speed so fast. Processing speed is so fast. Caching is very powerful. What is this persistence and all? We generally go in sessions and go in detail of that part. But you can cache your data in memory, which is uh, quite helpful as well in most of the cases. You can deploy your application with Mesos, YAN, or as a standalone cluster. Now, this is a very good feature that even let's say you have already configured your Hadoop with Yarn and all, you need not change your cluster specific to Apache Spark. Same cluster, you can use it, whatever you are using for your MapReduce for your Apache Spark. Similarly, Spark can be programmed with multiple programming language like R, Python, Scala. Okay, so there are a lot of languages, even Java is also used. So these four languages are used at the current moment. They both are same sort of. They both are exactly the same. Now, moving further. So using Hadoop through Apache Spark. So let's see how we can do all that. Now, Spark with HDFS makes it more powerful because you can execute your Spark applications on top of HDFS very easily. Now, second thing is Spark with MapReduce programming where Spark can be used along with MapReduce programming in the same Hadoop cluster. So you can run some application with MapReduce and same cluster you can use to execute your Spark application. No need to change all that. So that is one of the powerful things that you need not create separate cluster for Spark and separate cluster for MapReduce. Similarly, if I just explained you, even if you have already YARN configured, you can use it for Apache Spark. So this is very powerful because usually all of our older applications for MapReduce were uh, deployed on Jan and now Spark can take leverage of that. So like companies who want to migrate from MapReduce to Apache Spark, for them it is making the life very easy. Because you can just directly, it doesn't matter, you need not change the cluster manager, 
you can directly start working on it. For people who do not know what is YARN, just a brief about it. This is a cluster resource manager. Let's see a few more things. Now, what happens with Spark, right? So with Hadoop, you can combine up the things. That was one thing. So Spark is not intended to replace Hadoop. Keep this in mind. In fact, you can say it is an extension of your Hadoop framework. People have this confusion a lot. They say that Spark is going to replace Hadoop. No, it is not going to replace Hadoop because we are still leveraging all the things. We are using HDFS, you are using YARN, but just that the processing style you are changing. So Spark is not going to replace Hadoop. In fact, you can call it as an extension of the Hadoop framework. Second part, when we talk about Spark with MapReduce, right? Now they can also work together. So sometimes there are few applications. No, now they are very rare applications, but there can be applications where some part of the code they write it for with Spark and some part of the code they write with MapReduce. This is all possible. Okay. So let's say a company is transforming the code slowly from MapReduce to Apache Spark. They require time. So maybe some part of the code which is really important for them, they can start processing it with respect to Apache Spark and the rest of the map reduce code, they can leave it as it is. So they can keep on slowly converting like that because combinedly also they can work. So if you use Spark as standalone, it does not provide any distributed files there. Definitely, definitely something, right? Because if you're already using it as a standalone, let's say if you're not using SDFS, then in that case, definitely you are not leveraging the SDFS part, making it as a single process. Now, moving further, what are the important features in Apache Spark? Definitely the speed polygon. Polygon means multiple languages which you can use. R, Kela, Python, Java, right? So many languages. You can perform so much of analytics in memory computation. When you are executing everything in memory, this is called in-memory execution. You can integrate with Hadoop. You can also apply machine learning. And this makes Spark very powerful. In fact, it is so powerful that earlier days we used, not even earlier days, even now we have Mahout. Anybody who have not heard about Mahout? I hope everybody must be having. If not, let me just explain you. Mahout is a map reduced programming framework which is used to write your machine learning algorithms. So you can write your machine learning algorithms with Mahout. Now MapReduce, so Mahout converts the problem in MapReduce way and you get the output. Now MapReduce itself is slower. Plus machine learning algorithms are very highly iterative in nature. Because of this, your execution will become very slow in Mahout. Because machine learning algorithms are already slower in nature. Plus MapReduce programming is slower in nature. Now, because of that, Mahout algorithm takes sometimes hours to give an output. I'm not talking about even minutes. Sometimes to execute even a smaller data set, it sometimes can go even hours. Now, this is a major trouble with Mahout. Now, what Spark did, Spark come up with a very uh, famous framework called as MLLib. Spark MLLib. This is a substitute for Mahout. Now in MLLib, every processing is going to happen in memory. So that there will be no input output operation. Even the iteration what is happening will be happening in memory. So this will make the things very fast. Now because of this, what happened? That MapReduce programming, which was used by Mahout, people stopped using that. Now, what happened with this part? They stopped using this Mahout. In fact, the core developer of this Mahout part, they themselves migrated towards the MLLib site. Now, even if you talk to those core developers of Mahout, they themselves are recommending that if you want to execute machine learning problem, 
better execute it in the Spark framework only. Execute it by using Spark MLS rather than executing it in your Hadoop. So that's the reason in machine learning algorithms on big data, everyone is moving toward Spark MLS. Let's see all this part in detail now. When we talk about now in the speed part, right? We just were discussing about the speed part. Spark can run 100x time faster. Why? We already know the answer now, right? We have already seen that part. Now, when we talk about Polygon, we have just discussed that you can write in Scala, Python, Java, and R. Like so many languages are being supported. Now, next part. This is important. Lazy evaluation. Let me again take you back to my PPT. So in this case, now what actually happens? How this execution happens here? So first of all, what is happening here is it is not like that as soon as you hit this sc.txt file, it will immediately load this b1 block to the memory. It do not work like that. In fact, what it do is that as soon as you hit this line, it will generate this B1 block, but it will be empty initially. It will not be keeping any data. Then what will happen? You generated this number dot map. It will again generate B4 block, B5 block, and B6 block, but they all will be empty. There will be no data inside it. But as soon as you hit filter one dot collect, now what happens? As soon as you did this filter one dot collect, it will go to your F1, means filter one, which is nothing but B4, B5, B6, will say that I want to print your data. Now what is going to happen? Filter one will say I don't have any data. I am currently blank. Now this filter one will go and request number RDD to give the data. Now this B1, B2, B3, they are also empty right now. So they will also say that I am blank. It will go to f.txt. f.txt will be loading the data to num. Num will be loading the data to filter one. And then this filter one will be giving the output. So this thing is called as lazy evaluation means till that time you will not hit an action it will not print it will not do any execution beforehand so all the execution start only at the time when you hit an action if you are coming from pick programming background you might have already seen this feature till the time there you do not do a dump statement it do not execute anything which is beforehand. Now this portion is called lazy evaluation. Why lazy evaluation? Because we do not want to unnecessarily burden the memory. Till that time we are not printing the output. Means when we do not want to display something, we will not be doing any execution so that the data should not remain in the memory unnecessarily. So this is called your lazy evaluation. Clear about this part? Okay. This is called your lazy evaluation. Let us come back to the slides now. Now look at this part. So this is the lazy evaluation property. Now the real time computing, like at the real time as in when the data is coming, you can immediately start processing in the memory itself. This is the fourth property which we have already seen. Now the Fifth property, you can work Spark with SDFS, you can work Spark with MapReduce, same thing what we discussed, and you can also perform your machine learning libraries. That is the detailed part about this. Okay, so this is how you will be applying your machine learning. These are the major features about this Spark site. Okay, now let's take uh, a break and after that I will be talking about ecosystem because this will be a detailed topic where I need to spend a good time. So let's take a break and uh, then we will start. So after the break there are still a lot of topics to talk about. Uh, we will be also doing a practical and followed by a project in the end. Okay, We will just walk through the project that what kind of project you will be learning when you will be doing the uh, next sessions of Apache Spark. 
So let's uh, do all that after the break. So let's take a break of 10 minutes. So let's be back by 4.30 friends. Okay. So we will start about uh, ecosystem and practices and this is going to be very important. So please be on time. So please be back by 4.30. Okay. So everyone back. Can I get that confirmation? Everyone back? Able to hear me? Loud and clear? Okay. So let's move further. Now in Spark ecosystem, the things what we are working on, like for example, creating RDDs, that is a part of Spark core. Now Spark core is the major engine. On top of that, all the libraries are built. For example, we have Spark SQL, where what you can do, you can write a query in a SQL programming way, and internally it will be getting converted with respect to your Spark bit means the computation will happen in memory. Second thing is Spark streaming. This is the major component because of which it was possible that we are able to perform real time processing. So Spark streaming helps you to perform real time processing. Spark ML, which is a machine learning algorithm. I just discussed about this part when I was discussing about Maho. Spark MLF is a mostly a replacement for Maho because here the algorithm which we're taking ads in your uh, Hadoop site will take only few seconds in Spark MLF. That's a major improvement in MLF. That's the reason people are shifting towards this part. Graphics, where you can perform your graph kind of computation. You can publish your friend's recommendation in uh, Facebook, right? So there it generates internally graph and give you output. So any graph sort of computation is done using graphics. Spark R. This is a newly developed framework. They are still working on it. It's right now in the beta phase versions. Now here R is an open source language used by analysts. Now what Spark community want that they want to bring all those analysts to the Spark framework. And for that they are working hard by bringing this Spark R. Spark R have already made it and this is going to be the next big thing in the market. Now, how this ecosystem looks like? So there will be multiple things. For example, when we talk about Spark SQL, most of the times every computation happens with respect to your RDDs, but like in Spark SQL, we have something called as data frame. Now data frame is very analogous to your RDD, but the only difference would be because the data which will be sitting in memory will be in the tabular format. Now in this case, the data what you are keeping is going to also have column information. Along with row information, you will also have column information. That's the reason we do not call it as RDD. In fact, we call it as data frame. Similarly, in your machine learning also we have something called as ML pipeline which helps you to make it easier to combine multiple algorithms. So that is what your ML pipeline do in terms of MLM. Now let's talk about Spark Core. So Spark Core we already discussed any data which is residing in memory, we call that data as RDD and this is all about your Spark Core component where you will be able to work on large scale parallel system because all the data will be parallelly sitting, distributedly sitting. So all the computation will also happen parallelly. So this is about your Spark core component. When we talk about the architecture of Spark, now you can relate this as your name node, where your driver program is sitting, which we call it as master machine. So on your master machine, your Spark context will be there. Similarly, worker node is called as data node. So in Spark, we denote this data nodes as worker node. Now, there must be a place in memory where you will be keeping your block. That space in memory, we call it as executors. As you can see, there are two data nodes here, or worker node here. We are having executors. Means the space in your RAM where you will be keeping all the blocks will be called as executors. Now the blocks which are residing, right? For example, you were doing that dot map logic to get uh, the values less than 10, right? Now that logic, the code what you are executing on your RDD is called as task, okay? So that is called as task. 
Now in middle there will be a cluster manager just like yarn or something, yarn, misuse, whatever you want to keep. That will be an intermediate thing. Now everything will be moving towards this cycle path context. Then yarn will be taking care of the execution. Then in your executor your code will be sitting where you will be performing your task. You can also cache your data if you wish to. You can cache or persist your data. Now let's talk about Spark streaming. Spark streaming we have already discussing from good time that we have real time kind of processing available here. So what happens is here you will be as soon as you are getting the data you will be splitting the data into batches small small data and you will immediately do processing on it in memory that is done with the help of Spark streaming and the micro batch of data what you are creating is also called as D string. Now right now we are just talking at a very high level of all this topic because we just want to give you an idea about how things works. But when we go in the sessions these things are all in detail. Definitely in just two and a half to three hours it is impossible for us to cover everything but it is going to be kind of an overview of all the topics what I am giving you. Is it same as Spark code? Uh, what does Spark engine do? Yes, Spark engine is helping you. It is just working like a Spark code. It is converting your things to your RDD way and helping you to process the data. Okay, that is the role of your Spark code side. Now, similarly, when we talk about Spark streaming, now Spark streaming, as I was talking about, you can get the real time data and all. Now, the data from where you can be pulled up, it can be from multiple sources. You can use Kafka, you can use HBase, it can be pulled up from parquet format any sort of data and the real time bring the data into the spark system after that you can apply anything you can apply spark sql means you can execute your sql queries on top of it you can execute a machine learning code on top of it you can apply your simple rdd code on top of it anything and store back all the output either in your hbase your memory sql kafka elastic search whatever you want to do but main thing is when the data reads here at the real time you can immediately start doing processing. So even the other libraries can pull up the data immediately and can start acting on it. Now, so this is the same example like you can just pull up the data from Kafka, Flume, SGFS, Kinesis, Twitter from any of the sources bring it to the Spark streaming then save it in SGFS or database or maybe a UI dashboard wherever you want to. Similar things are there like you will be getting an input data stream, you will be converting into a batch of small small data and then in the batch itself you will be outputting everything. So what is happening? So you are what the batches of data what you are creating. So I can call all those things maybe small small RDBs what I am generating. So that's the reason it is denoted here. So you are getting a D stream in small small batch of data. So maybe this is RDB which is getting generated for a shorter time. Now all the outputs will be given afterwards. So this is a very high level picture of how Spark streaming is going to work. Similarly in Spark SQL, now this is very powerful thing because it can give you an output very quickly. Now if you have a SQL with Spark you can execute it and that is called your Spark SQL. Now Spark SQL can handle your structured data, semi-structured data but cannot handle your unstructured data. Because anyway we are performing SQL kind of query so it makes sense for it to perform on semi-structured and the structured data only not on unstructured. In the streaming data structured it will be structured. It will be structured data. So this is going to be my structured data. Now support for various formats you can bring the data from multiple formats like Parquet, JSON, Hive. Right? Similarly all the queries what you are converting to different RDDs you can do that as well. You can be using data frames, you can uh, shuffle it to a RDD as well. So all those things are possible in your Spark SQL. The performance if I compare with your Hive is very high. In Hadoop system if this is a red mark whichever is there is your Hadoop system. You can easily see that we are taking so much of less time in comparison to your Hadoop systems. So that is the major advantage when using this Spark SQL. Now it uses the JDBC driver which is a Java driver or ODBC driver which is the Oracle driver for your connection, for creating connection. You can also create your user defined function just like in Hive. So you can also do that in Spark as well. Okay. So if you have already a pre-built API, you can use it. If you do not have it, create a UDF and then you can execute it. 
If you do not know UDF in Hive, there is a concept of UDF, not only in Hive, it's a general concept where you can create your own function, you can write your own Java code and can use it as a function in your Spark SQL or in Hive. That is called your UDF part. So this is how your Spark SQL works. Now what usually is the workflow for it? You are going to have a data source from where you will be getting the data. You will be converting to a data frame. Data frame is nothing but analogous to RDD, but it will be a tabular format. So it will be having rows as well as column information. Now you are going to have the named column. You are going to have interpreted, converted to a Spark way, doing the computation. Your Spark SQL services will be running and in the end you will be showing the output. So this is a high level picture of how Spark SQL works. Now, let's talk about MLib, which is machine learning library. There are two kinds of algorithm. One is supervised algorithm, second is unsupervised algorithm. In supervised algorithm, you already know the output. You already know some part of the output. Using that, you are predicting something new. In unsupervised learning, you do not know anything about your data. You don't have even the previous data output and you want to get some output from it. This is called unsupervised learning. So an ML can handle both the things. Now in supervised, we have multiple examples like classification, regression. Similarly, unsupervised, we have clustering, P, uh, SVD, PCA, all these things are available for unsupervised. In fact, it's much more. It is given very less here just to explain you. Is there any limitation of Spark SQL? No, no. There is no such limitation coming. Okay? You can execute all the things which are available. In fact, there is uh, something called as uh, like your Spark context, you also have a Hive context. Now, if you want to execute your Hive query through Spark, you can do it with the help of Hive context. So there is no such limitation. Okay, so you can still keep on writing the code in Hive and can execute directly in Spark SQL. Now, moving further, what are the techniques we have? What are the various data sources in Spark SQL? Uh, sorry, we just already discussed the same thing. So we have Parquet, we have JSON. Let me go back to quickly show you again. You can get it from CSV, HBase, from database, Oracle DB, MySQL, Parquet, JSON. All these are your data sources. Okay. This is there available here. So you can just get it from all these data sources. So a lot of data sources you can use it for this purpose. Clear Zora? Now, so in classification, generally what happens? Just to give you an example, uh, you must have noticed the spam email box. I hope everybody must be having, uh, have seen that. Spark in, uh, your spam email box in your Gmail. Now, when any new email comes up, how Google decide whether it's a spam email or a non-spam email. That is done as an example of classification, clustering. Let's say uh, you might have seen this Google News. Right? When you type something, it groups all the news together. That is called your clustering. Regression. Regression is also one of the very important part. It is not here. Regression is, let's say you have house and you want to sell that house and you have no idea what is the optimal price you should keep for your house? Now this regression will help you to achieve that. Collaborative filtering. You might have seen when you go to your uh, Amazon webpage that they show you a recommendation, right? You can buy this because you are buying this, right? This is done with the help of collaborative filtering, okay? So this algorithm is used for your recommendation part. Graphics, an important component again. In graphics, you will you can apply all your problems. You can solve all your problems at the graph page. Now there are multiple things. We have edges which denotes the relationship. Like can you see this part? Bob, Carol, these are vertices where you can call it also a leaf. Now the connector between them is called as edge. Okay, that is just being shown here. Now if there's an arrow here that is called a directed graph, like we have seen in the lineage also, right? So that is your directed graph. Now what are the use cases for it? There can be multiple, but let's see a few examples. Now all of you must have seen this Google map, right? Google map you must have seen. Now Google map at the back end they are using graphics. What they do is 
when you apply something, it do not just search for one path. It in fact goes for multiple paths, and it shows you a optimal path, which is maybe less least time or maybe the least distance. Now that computation, what all is happening to compute all the graphs, checking that which will take less time, right? Computation of all that is done with the help of graphics. Similarly, there are a lot of examples for fraud detections. Also, banks are using this graphic. You can also uh, see this Twitter or LinkedIn. They give you recommendations of friends, right? That is all examples can be done with the help of graphics. So all your recommendations happens because they generate the graph and all that, and based on that they compute and give you the output. So there also graphics is used. So graphics is a very strong library at available with us. Now, before I move to the project. I want to show you some practical part. How we will be executing Spark things. So let me take you to the VM machine, which will be provided by Adureka. So all these machines are also provided by Adureka. So you need not worry about from where I will be getting the software, what I will be doing with my head roll there. Everything is taken care by Adureka. Now, once you will be coming to this, you will see a machine like this. Let me close this. So what will happen? You will see a blank machine like this. Let me show you that. So this is how your machine will look like. Now, what you are going to do in order to start working, you will be opening this terminal by clicking on this black option. Now, after that, what you can do is you can now uh, go to your Spark. Now, how I can work with Spark? In order to execute any program in Spark by using Scalar program. You will be entering it as Spark hyphen shell. If you type Spark hyphen shell, it will take you to the scale of run where you can write your Spark program, but by using scalar programming language. You can notice this. Now, can you see this part? It is also giving me 1.5.2 version. So that is the version of your Spark. Now you can see here. You can also see this part. Spark context available as a thing. When you get connected to your Spark shell, you can just see uh, this will be by default available to you. Let this get connected. It takes some time. Now. We got connected, so we got connected to this scale up run. Now, if I want to come out of it, I will just type exit. It will just let me come out of this prompt. Now, secondly, I can also write my programs with my Python. So what I can do, if I want to do programming in Spark, but with by Python programming language, I will be connecting with PySpark. So I just need to type PySpark. In order to get connected with your Python, okay. I'm not getting connected now because I'm not going to require Python. I will be explaining everything with Scalar right now. But if you want to get connected, you can type PySpark. So let's again get connected to my Spark hyphen shell. Now, meanwhile, this is getting connected. Let us create a small file. So let us create a file. So currently, if you notice, I don't have any file. Okay, I already have a dot txt. So let's say I say cat a dot txt. So I have some data. One, two, three, four, five. This is my data which is with me. Now what I am going to do? Let me push this file. Undo. So let me if I check if if it is already available in my uh, system as well. Means HDFS system. Undo DFS hyphen cat a dot txt. Just to quickly check if it is already available. Okay. So there is no such file. So let me first put this file to my system. So put a dot txt. So this will put it in the default location of SDFS. Now, if I want to read it, I can see this file. So again, I'm assuming that you are aware of this SDFS command. So you can see now this one, two, three, four file is coming from my Hadoop file system. Now, what I want to do, I want to use this file in my uh, in my system of Spark. Now, how I can do that? So let me come here. So in Scala, in Scala, we do not have integer float and all. Like in Java, we do used to define like this, right? Integer a is equal to 10. Like this, we used to define. 
but in Scala, we do not use this data type. In fact, what we do is we call it as var. So if I use var a is equal to 10, it will automatically identify that it is an integer value. Notice, it will tell me that a is of my integer type. Now if I want to update this value to 20, I can do that. Now, let's say if I want to update this to A, B, C like this. This will throw an error. Why? Because A is already defined as integer and you are trying to assign some A, B, C string type. So that is the reason you got this error. Similarly, there is one more thing called as val. Val B is equal to 10. Let's say if I do, it works exactly similar to val but have one difference. Now in this case if I do b is equal to 20, you will see an error. And why this error? Because when you define something as val, it is a constant. It is not going to be variable anymore. It will be a constant and that is the reason if you define something as val, it will be not updatable. You will you should not be able to update that value. So this is how in scalar you will be doing your program. So that for variable part, for val for your constant part. Now, so you will be doing like this. Now let's use it for the example what we have learned. Now let's say if I want to create an RDD, so val number is equal to st.txt file. Remember this API? We have learned this API already, st.txt file. Now let me give this file a.txt. If I give this file a.txt, it will be creating an RDD. See this part. It is telling that I created an RDD of string type. Now if I want to read this data, I will call number.collect. This will print me the value what was available. Can you see? Now this line what you are seeing here, is going to be from your memory. This is your from memory it is reading up and that is the reason it is showing up in this particular manner. So this is how you will be performing your step. Now second thing, I told you that Spark can work on standalone systems as well, right? So right now what was happening was that we have executed this part in our SDFS. Now, if I want to execute this on our local file system, can I do that? Yes, it can still do that. What you need to do for that? So, if in that case, the difference will come here. Now, what the file you are giving here would be, instead of giving like that, you will be denoting this file keyword before that. And after that, you need to give your local path. For example, what is this path? slash home slash adureka. This is a local path, not SDFS path. So you will be writing slash home slash adureka a dot txt. Now if you give this, this will be loading the file into memory, but not from your HDFS. Instead what this did is, this loaded it from your, this loaded it from your local disk. So that is the difference here. So as you can see, in the second case, I am not even using my HDFS, which means what? Now can you tell me why this error? This is interesting. Why this error? Input path does not exist because I have given a typo here. Okay. Now if you notice why I did not get this error here. Why I did not get this error here? This file do not exist, but still I did not got any error because of lazy evaluation. Lazy evaluation kind of made sure that even if you have given the wrong path, it created an empty RDD, but it has not executed anything. So all the output or the error mistake you are able to receive when you hit that action of collect. Now in order to uh, correct this value, I need to correct this Edureka and this time if I execute it, it will work. Okay, you can see this output. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this time it works fine. So now we should be more clear about the lazy evaluation as well. So even if you are giving the wrong file name, doesn't matter. 
Suppose I want to use Spark in production unit, but not on top of Hadoop. Is it possible? Yes, you can do that. You can do that, Sameer. But usually that's not what you do. But yes, if you want, you can do that. There are a lot of things which you can do. You can also uh, deploy it on your Amazon clusters as well. Lot of things you can do there. How will it provide the distribute? In that case, we'll be using some other distribution system. So in that case, you are not using this part. You can deploy it. It will be just definitely you will not be able to kind of go across and distribute in the cluster. You will not be able to leverage that redundancy. But you can use even Amazon S3 and all for that. Okay. So that is how you will be using this. Now you got it. Great. So this is how you will be performing your practicals. As I said, how you will, will be working on this path. I will be explaining you as I told you. So this is how things work. Now let us see an interesting use case. So for that, let us go back to our PPT. This is going to be very interesting. So let's see this use case. Look at this use case. This is very interesting. Okay. Now this use case is for earthquake detection using Spark. So uh, in Japan, you might have already seen that there are so many earthquakes uh, coming. You might have heard about it. I uh, definitely you might have not seen it, but you must have heard about it. That there are so many uh, earthquakes which happens in Japan. Now how to solve that problem with Apache Spark? So I'm just going to give you a glimpse of what kind of problems we solve in the sessions. Definitely we are not going to walk through in detail of this. But you will get an idea how powerful Spark is. Okay, just to give you a little bit of brief here. But all these projects you learn at the time of sessions. Now, so let's see this part. How we will be using this. Okay? So as everybody must be knowing what is earthquake, right? So earthquake is uh, like a shaking of your surface of the earth. Your home starts shaking up. All those events start happening. In fact, uh, if you are from India, you might have seen recently there was an earthquake incident which came from Nepal, right? Even uh, recently, two days back also, there was an uh, uh, earthquake incident, right? So this earthquake keeps on coming. Now, very important part is, let's say if the earthquake is a major earthquake, like hurricane or maybe tsunami, maybe forest fires, maybe a volcano. Now, it's very important for them to kind of estimate that earthquake is going to come. They should be able to kind of predict it beforehand. It should not happen that at the last moment they got to know that okay the earthquake is coming, earthquake came, earthquake came. No, it should not happen like that. It, they should be able to estimate all these things beforehand. They should be able to predict beforehand. So this is the system which Japan is using already. So this is a real time kind of use case what I am presenting. So Japan is already using this Spark framework in order to solve this earthquake problem. So we are going to see that, how they are using it. Okay. Now let's say uh, what happens in uh, Japan earthquake model. So whenever there is an earthquake coming, for example, at 2.46 p.m. on March uh, 2011, now Japan earthquake uh, early warning was detected. Now the thing was, as soon as it detected, immediately they start sending the alert to schools, to the lift, to the factories, every station, through TV stations, they have immediately kind of told everyone so that all the students who are there in school, they got the time to go under the desk, and bullet trains which were running, they stopped. Otherwise, the, if immediately the earth will start shaking, now the bullet trains are already running at the very high peak. They want to ensure that there should be no sort of casualty because of that. So all the bullet trains stopped all the elevators, the lift which were running, they stop, otherwise some incident can happen. In 60 seconds, 60 seconds before this number, they were able to inform almost everyone. They have sent the message, they have a broadcast on TV, all those things they have done immediately to all the people so that they can send at least this message, whoever can receive it. And that has saved millions of lives. So how they were able to achieve that? They have done all this with the help of Apache Spark. That is the most important thing. So how they, because you can see that everything what they are doing there, they are doing it on the real time system, right? If they cannot just collect that data and then later they process it. They did everything at the real time system. So they collected the data, 
immediately process it and as soon as they detected that earthquake they immediately informed it. In fact this happened in 2011. Now they, they are using it very frequently because Japan is one of the area which is very frequently uh, kind of affected by all this. So as I said the main thing is we should be able to process the data in real time. That's the major thing. You should be able to handle the data from multiple sources because data may be coming from multiple sources. Uh, maybe different different sources they might be suggesting some or the other uh, event which because of which we are predicting that uh, okay this uh, earthquake can happen. It should be very easy to use because if it is very complicated then in that case for a user to use it it will be very become complicated so he may not be able to solve the problem. Now even in the end how to send the alert message is important. Right? So all those things are taken care by your spa. Now there are two kinds of layer in your uh, earthquake. The number one layer is a primary wave and second is secondary wave. There are two kinds of waves in an earthquake. Primary wave is like when the earthquake is just about to start. It starts with the epicenter and it's when the earthquake is going to start. Secondary wave is more severe wave which starts after primary wave. Now what happens in secondary wave is once that starts it can do maximum damage. Because primary wave you can see the initial wave but the secondary will be on top of that. So there will be some details with respect to that. I'm not going in detail of that. But yeah, there will be some details with respect to that. Now what we are going to do, using sparks we will be creating our ROC. So let's go and see that in our machine, how we will be calculating our ROC, which using which we will be solving this problem later. And we will be calculating this ROC with the help of Apache Spark. Let's again come back to this machine. Now in order to work on that, let's first exit from this console. Once you exit from this console, now what you are going to do, I have already created this project and kept it here because uh, we just want to give you an overview of this. Let me go to my download section. There is a project called as Earth2. So this is your project. Initially, what all things you will be having? You will not be having all the things initial part. So what will happen? So let's say if I go to my downloads, from here I have Earth2 project. Okay. Now initially I will not be having this target directory, project directory, bin directory. We will be using our SBT framework. If you do not know SBT, this is a scalar build tool which takes care of all your dependencies. So it takes care of all your dependencies and all. So uh, it is very similar to Maven. If you already know Maven, you uh, this SBT is very similar. But at the same time, I prefer SBT because SBT is more easier to write in comparison to your Maven. So you will be writing this build.sbt. So this file you will have to write here, build.sbt. Now in this file, you will be giving the name of your project, your what's the version of SBT using, version of scalar what you are using, what are the dependencies you have, with what versions dependencies you have, like for Spark Core, I'm using 1.5.2 version of Spark. So you are telling that whatever in my program I am writing, if I require anything related to Spark Core, go and get it from this website org.apache.org, download it, install it. If I require any dependency for Spark streaming program, for this particular version 1.5.2, go to this website, or this link and execute it. Similar thing for MLLib as well. So you're just telling that. Now, once you have done this, you will be creating a folder structure. Your folder structure would be you need to create a SRC folder. After that, you will be creating a main folder. From main folder, you will be creating again a folder called as scalar. Now, inside that, you will be keeping your program. So now here, you will be writing your program. So you are writing, can you see this streaming uh, scalar, network on scalar, art dot scalar. So let's keep it as a black box for now. So we will be writing the code to achieve this problem statement. Now what we are going to do, let's come out of this. Go to your main project folder and from here you will be writing SBT package. It will start downloading with respect to your SBT. It will check your program, whatever dependency you require for Spark code, Spark streaming, Spark MLF, it will download and install it. It will just download and install it. 
So we are not going to execute it because I have already done it before and it also takes some time. So, so that's the reason I'm not doing it. Now once you have built this packet, you will find all this directory, target directory, project directory. These got created later only. Now what is going to happen? Once you have created this, you will go to your Eclipse. So your Eclipse you will open. So let me open my Eclipse. So this is how your Eclipse looks like. Now I already have this program in front of me, but let me tell you how you will be bringing this program here. You will be going to your import option. With import you will be selecting your existing project into workspace. Next, once you do that, you need to select your main project. For example, you need to select this R2 project what you have created and click on OK. Once you do that, there will be a project directory coming here. This R2 will come here. Now, what you need to do, go to your src slash main and all, ignore all this program. I require only this earth.scala because this is where I have written my main function code. Now, after that, once you reach to this, you need to go to your run as scala application and your path code will start executing. Now, this will return me ROC and all. Okay, let's see this output. Now, if I see this, this will show me once it's finished executing. See this output. Area under ROC is this. So, this is all computed with the help of Spark program. Similarly, there are other programs also which will help you to screen the data and all. So, I'm not walking over all that. Now, let's come back to my PPT and see that what is the next step what we will be doing. So you can see this there will be an Excel sheet getting created. Now I am keeping my ROC here. Now after you have created your ROC, you will be generating a graph. Now in Japan there is one important thing. Japan is already an affected area of your earthquake and now the trouble here is that whatever it's not like even for a minor earthquake, I should start sending the alert, right? I don't want to do all that for the minor uh, minor affection. In fact, the buildings and the infrastructure what is created in Japan is in such a way, if any earthquake below 6 magnitude comes there, there uh, the homes are designed in a way that there will be no damage. There will be no damage there. So this is the major thing when you work with uh, your Japan framework. Now in Japan, so that means with 6 they are not even worried, but above 6 they are worried. Now for that there will be a graph generation what you can do. You can do it with Spark as well. Once you generate this graph, you will be seeing that anything which is going above 6. If anything which is going above 6, we should immediately start the alert. Now ignore all this programming side because that is what we have just created and shown you this execution part. Now, if you have to visualize the same result, this is what is happening. This is showing my ROC, but if my earthquake is going to be greater than 6, then only raise the alert. Then only send the alert to all the people. Otherwise, stay calm. That is what the project, what we generally show in our Spark program site. Now, it is not the only project. We also kind of create multiple other projects as well. For example, I kind of create a model just like how Walmart do it. How Walmart may be creating uh, whatever sales is happening with respect to that they are using a purchase park and at the end they are kind of making you visualize the output of doing whatever analytics they are doing. So that is all done with Spark. So all those things we walk you through when we do the course session. All the things you learn there and feel that all these projects are easy. Right now, since you do not know the topic, you are not able to get 100% of the project. But at that time, once you know each and every topic separately, you will have a clear picture of how Spark is handling all these use cases. So this is it, what we uh, wanted to just discuss with respect to Spark. So I hope this session is useful for all of you. You got some insight on how Apache Spark works, how, why we are going with Apache Spark, and what are the important things available and what are the important libraries available in Apache Spark. Any questions from all of you? Please ask. Over to you guys. 
Apache start processing is real time or near real time? Usually it is, you can create real time, but it will not be helpful. So it is almost near to real time. Because even right now when I'm talking to you, sort of, it is not exact real time. Even my voice is reaching to you in few milliseconds at least, right? Or in nanoseconds. Even if you're looking at my screen, you are not seeing that data in real time. So nothing in this world is exact real time. We do not define that, right? So always there will be even a minor delay that is called near real time. So that's what we can design. So generally that is what we are going to design in part. So it will be near real time. Any other questions from anyone? This session is very helpful. I learned a lot today. Thanks, Amir. So, so if you want to learn any of the detailed part, you can get in touch with Edureka. I'm also one of the instructors there. And let me tell you, this is one of the hottest topic in the market. And right now, there are so many jobs available. Do not go by my words or Edureka words. Just go and explore yourself. You will see maximum jobs of big data in Spark domain. And that is the reason a lot of people are moving towards learning Apache Spark. And Edureka has helped so many students learning it in making, shaping their career. A lot of people have got successfully the job in this domain. Okay, so thank you everyone for making this uh, session excellent. I hope that you love this Edureka session. Hope our path meets uh, once again sometime maybe in a session. I would love to see you once again. So thank you everyone. I hope you enjoyed listening to this video. Please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply to them at the earliest. Do look out for more videos in our playlist and subscribe to our Edureka channel to learn more. Happy learning.